A lot of folks know Daniel and I travel extensively, maybe some folks don't realize how extensively, to serve other landowners to help them create habitat and hunting improvement programs for their property. That cold air that's sinking. Put down. that in scale, you know, just in the last few months or so, Daniel's in Ontario and I've been in Florida, Texas, and North Dakota, and pretty much everywhere in between. We travel a lot. So it's kind of embarrassing to see this wood lot on my property behind me, but remember, we just started the Proven Grounds 2 a couple years ago and we've still got a lot of work to do. I thought this would be a really good illustration of low quality habitat and then take you along through the process as it improves. So when you're looking behind me, you see a lot of multi-stem oaks. These are mainly post oaks in here, a couple of red oaks but a lot of multi-stem, and multi-stem trees are usually from a stump sprout. This area was logged or cut many years ago, and we've got all these stump sprouts. Here's, you know, a three stump tree right here, or a three sprout tree, and three right there. I mean, they're just, I don't know, like half the trees are multi-stem. That's not the way God created trees to grow, at least oak species. So this area was logged, and we're looking at the regrowth. Right now, it's obviously just brown on the ground. I would say less than 50 pounds of forage to eat, maybe, you know, 10 pounds per acre of forage to eat year round. Now there's gonna be some acorns drop, wasn't any this year, but some years be acorns, but not as many acorns as they could because even though the ground is pretty light right now, a lot of sun coming through. Remember, we're in February. All the leaves are off and the sun is coming through those limbs. So in a full canopy, you know, come May or so, this is total shade in here, like 99% shade. And without sunshine, plants can't photosynthesize and grow. Here's just the truth. If you're not getting photosynthesis at zero to three feet, it's probably really low quality deer and turkey habitat. Now you may have tagged a big old buck going through a hardwood flat, you know, and he was going through here and he found a rub line or a scrape and eating acorns or whatever and you whipped him, boy, I mean, you tagged a good buck. But that's not good habitat. He was just passing through. Again, if there is no photosynthesis during the growing season, reaching the ground, if you're looking at a bed of leaves, that is very low quality wildlife habitat. So we have really low quality timber. It's not gonna be marketable. It's a lot of multi-stem trees and no food. And the trees are not healthy because when the leaves are on, there's tremendous competition between the canopies. When we look up, most of the limbs are reaching up. That's another telltale sign you can use to evaluate the timber where you hunt, especially oak trees or hardwood trees and even pines to some extent. But when they're all reaching up, a real small canopy, feeding something that weighs a ton or more wood is heavy, then that tree is malnourished and it can express its full potential, just like a deer being malnourished and not expressing its full farm production or antler potential. And in a deer herd, when that happens, we try to provide more food and reduce the amount of critters competing for that food. We harvest does and you know plant some food plots or do a prescribed fire, open the canopy. With timber, biological principles are the same. We need to increase food and reduce the competition. So I'm going to come in here on my own property and terminate some of these trees, half of these trees, maybe more, and then that will allow those canopies to expand. They'll be reaching for sunshine so they can make more leaves, photosynthesize more, and create more food because of less competition. I'm not bringing fertilizer in, no matter how much I fertilize these low quality trees with super tight canopies, that's like feeding a deer that's way overpopulated, a deer herd. It's just not gonna work well. So fertilizing these trees is certainly not the answer and that's silliness. I need sunshine down here. So we're going to do just like a deer herd. We're gonna reduce amount of trees out here so there's more food for each remaining tree and they can express more of their potential and oftentimes that increased potential is greater acorn production. I can have fewer trees and have more tons of acorns produced per unit area. My goals and objectives here is better wildlife habitat and also for Miss Tracy, 
more aesthetically pleasing. This is just basically a wall of green from the roadside, the outside edge, and just shade it out. Don't you think this would be prettier if this was wildflowers in amongst some pretty trees and tall native grasses growing, blowing in the wind? That would be more aesthetically pleasing and unequivocally it's better wildlife habitat, not just deer and turkey, but better for many species. What you may not know is this area has been burned three times in the last four years. All dormant season, or this time of year, there's nothing green, the leaves aren't green, the nutrients of a tree is down in the root system, but this has had prescribed fire during the dormant season before spring green up three out of the last four years. And I try to tell people all the time, I'm a huge fan of prescribed fire. It's an extremely important tool for wildlife management and the health of the ecosystem. But if you're just burning under a closed canopy, probably high graded forest, you're removing leaf litter, you may be killing a few ticks, but there's no sign of grasses or forbs growing in here. It did nothing to really improve the health of the deer herd quail, turkey, songbirds, whatever. It's just removing leaf litter and then more leaves fall. It's actually a detriment because when we remove all that leaf litter with nothing on the ground, get a really hard rain. There might be some erosion and certainly those raindrops hitting bare ground can cause soil compaction. So my first goal, and I'll probably keep burning, but my first goal is to open up this canopy. Let's walk around, maybe give you some examples of trees I would take out and paint the picture and share the techniques we're going to use. Growing Deer is brought to you by Bass Pro Shops and Cabela's. Also by Green Cover Food Plots, Winchester, PH Outdoors, Moultrie Mobile, Steel, Fleet Outdoor Apparel, Morel Targets, Fourth Arrow, Scorpion Venom Archery, Case IH Tractors, Ward Laboratories, Burris Optics, G5 Broadheads, Prime bows and redneck hunting blocks. So, just walking around, I mean, right here is a multi stem tree. And if I go over here not too far, there's a fairly straight tree for a post oak that's, you know, again, too much competition overgrown. So, I'm probably taking out these multi stem trees. When I look up, this has very minimal canopy. And we'll show you this in a second. But when you look up, all the limbs are reaching over here to where there was a little sunshine where they're competing against other trees, like right here, right above me, there's almost no limbs, no limbs. So that just, you see this all over, trees growing over a road in a closed campy forest, what are reaching for sunshine, they're starving, they're doing whatever they can to get that sun. That's why trees along the road and they die or whatever, almost always fall across the road because they're reaching over that road where there's an open space, no competition to get sunshine, so the weight's that way, and whatever reason they die, they're gonna fall right across the road, you gotta whip out your steel and cut them out away. So, taking out that tree, taking out this tree, you see some little, you know, six, eight inch stuff here, gnarly, not gonna be anything. I'm taking those out, because when I come over here, I'm taking this multi stem out, and while I'm in here, I'm going to use the girdle and herbicide technique, so I've got a chainsaw. I'm going to, I'm going to fell every seed or just fell it. And if it happens to fall against the leaf tree, like this tree I want to leave standing, I'm going to drag it back so when I burn, it doesn't get so hot right next to the base of this tree that I scar the bark and get enough heat that it actually can kill the cells or boil and cause eruption of the cells in the cambium layer that inner bark that's the tree's circulatory system. So I'm leaving this tree, it's the best tree in this neighborhood. And what I like to do is get to the leaf tree and then I can say, okay, I'm taking this, 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 and I go all the way over to the next tree. So over here, I don't know, 10 yards or so is another nice oak with good form and there's four gnarly trees between us. So I'm gonna go. I want to save this, I want to save that. What do I need to terminate in between? And when I look up, because of the competition, there are many yards between this tree's canopy and that tree's canopy. There's room for those limbs to expand. If I'm thinning, but I'm leaving trees right next to each other and there's no room to expand, maybe I'm only taking the shorter understory trees out and leaving that crown full, I'm not going to meet my objective. You've got to have sun, ideally, if this is the leaf tree, 
all the way around it. Now you're gonna have times, maybe there's two great white oaks right here, or two great post oaks or whatever. You're gonna get that hourglass shape, big canopy here, big canopy here, but here where they're competing, you're not gonna have much. A three quarter canopy is okay. But I'm only doing that if I really like both those trees. I'd rather have full sunshine. So I'm leaving this tree. And if we just look right here, I'm taking out one, two, three, killing the cedar, four. This is really one tree, five, two stems, six, that gnarly oak over there, seven, eight, this is one tree, nine, 10. I'm taking out 10 trees to free up or release foresters, wallop, I'll just call this releasing that tree. We're releasing its potential, like we call how we manage our food plots and native vegetation, the release process. We're restoring basically how the creator built the timber or the soil, and we're releasing the soil's potential, or in this case, the forest potential. So I'm going over here. Another, for this woodlot, for this woodlot, a nice tree. And it's got a fairly decent crown. Still the limbs are reaching up, they're not out. You've seen a great big oak tree, you know, in your yard or churchyard or schoolyard, and the limbs are going out. Big old canopy. And man, those seems those oaks just make a ton of acorns almost every year. Well, they've literally got more leaves photosynthesizing, creating more energy for the tree so it can be more productive. You got a little big canopy, all those solar receptors, the leaves aren't creating much energy the tree can't produce much. And my good friend, Dr. Craig Harper, did some research years ago. I know everyone knows Craig. And Craig and I went to Clemson together. He, he's more on the native vegetation side. I was more on the deer side back then. Craig has done a bunch of great work. And I think it was Craig to come up with the research that showed that releasing a tree and letting it get full sunshine is the best known way to get greater acorn production not adding fertilizer or anything else, just letting it work its magic and photosynthesize more. Thanks, Craig, for that great research. So here I'm gonna take out this tree, this tree, this tree. Even on what I'm calling a good tree, you can tell it was a stump sprout, but it's the best tree in the neighborhood. Remember, get out from these limbs right here. Of course, all, all these little trees are going. Uh, you gotta remember, it's not the best tree, it's the best tree in that area where I have sunshine. So, you know, if I go over here and there's nothing but gnarly trees, well, I'm not gonna kill every tree, I'm gonna take the best of the gnarly trees and leave that one. Ideally, we're gonna come up with somewhere around 60 basal feet per acre. So let's just say this tree right here is a foot. You know, I put my two hands together, but somewhere roughly around a foot. So if I had 60 of those trees per acre, an acre is 208 feet by 208 feet, that would be 60 basal feet per acre. Foresters measure basal feet at four and a half feet or about chest height on most people. And that works because if you've got 126 inch trees, well six inch trees only have so big a crown. Or if you've got 32 foot trees, they probably have a much bigger crown. So if you took 32 foot trees and squeezed them together, that would be 60 basal feet per acre. Now, there's always exceptions and you know, what if this, that, the other. Our goal again is to have a tree getting sunlight all around it, going far enough away to the next best tree in that neighborhood and terminating trees around it to get sunlight all around it. If we're getting somewhere, you know, 50%, 30, 40, 50% sun to the forest floor when the leaves are on. Not now when there's no leaves blocking the sun, but when the leaves are on, and we couple that with the prescribed fire, usually if fire's necessary or can help stimulate that seed bank, you're gonna go from, you know, a total biological desert, just a pass-through area, just a pass-through area, to producing groceries and cover. Increase the carrying capacity on your property make it better hunting and more aesthetically pleasing. I, I don't know who doesn't like that. Another cedar tree right here. Got the steel. 
I use a battery powered saw when I'm doing this. It would cut cedars like that easy. I'm gonna drop it in here where there's no leaf trees. And when I terminate those trees, I don't really care if that burns right next to a terminate tree. I don't wanna drop it again right next to this and get a real heavy flame that could cook the bark of this tree. Just be mindful when you're doing this. Let's take a little walk on in here. All these little hickories and stuff are gone. I'm making decisions on the best form and by species. This area is almost completely a post oak flat, so if there's a big white oak in here, you can bet even if it's got not very good form, that tree gets a pass, so I'm gonna free up everything around it. If I've got a tree that looks pretty good, and we're gonna do this right here, here we have this tree, looks pretty good, and we're over here 10 or 12 feet to a tree that's not quite as big as good, but when I look up, this tree is hollow. I can see where something started here years ago, and I'm sure if I stuck, you know, got a fire going there, the smoke would be pouring out here. I've got plenty of squirrel dens, so I'm not worried about squirrels. I'm probably gonna terminate this tree because it's, you know, not in very good health. And I'm gonna save this tree that appears to be in better health. So a lot of little things coming to mind. If you do this much, you can just make these decisions about as quick as you're walking around. I go through here, it's pretty much junk for a ways, right? And then I look up, and because it's junk and not much growing, this tree's got a bit more of a crown. See this nice big post oak over here? It's got a bit more of a crown. I'm gonna fail to see her again, unless I was thinking, and this is where we're thinking all the time, guys, I get this treated right, I may wanna put a tree stand in there I might leave that cedar for some screening cover for me to hunt her. That's about the only reason I'm gonna leave a cedar, but there's nothing around here, so I know that's my leave tree, and I don't have to work on much, but I got something really cool right over here I wanna show you. And trees just dying. I, obviously, I didn't kill this. It's just, you know, these trees are not healthy. So the weakest ones croak first, but you're starting to see some green up here. Well, that's failed cedars. There's this hill drops off. The topography drops off right here. So that south sun was able to come in and that allowed these cedars, or cedar seed everywhere to get going. And I just had a crew, if you're looking for someone to do this kind of work, you know, write us at info at and I'll tell you the name and number of the crew I use. We're cutting a bunch of acre cedars. This wasn't me out here on a Saturday afternoon. We're cutting a bunch of acre cedar, but you can see you know, through the canopy, that really drops off. So sun was coming in, it allowed cedars to penetrate about this far or so, and then there was just enough canopy that it was blocking these cedars. Well, these cedars just gonna keep going and going, choking everything out, so just failed them. Remember on a cedar, when you cut it off below the bottom living limb, it's dead. You don't have to use a herbicide or anything. It doesn't sprout back. If I cut this oak off, it would most likely sprout back. So. We felled these cedars. I'll go through and drag them away from any leaf trees before we burn them. They're too green. You wouldn't get very good consumption now. Uh, just a perfect example of where sun gets in. In many states, you're gonna have a lot of cedars, eastern red cedars, because I always get that mail from the northern boys. Hey man, white cedar is excellent deer food, and it is. It's one of the only known trees that deer can survive on without other vegetation we are way out of the range of white cedar. The cedars here are eastern red cedar. So when I look right here, I see a pretty big area, 30 yards by 40 yards, that just little, you know, six inch or less trees. I'm thinking high the old food plot. I make this area, you know, cover. Um, you know, we walked in maybe 100 yards from the road or so. I can get here real easy. It's a higher spot and make a high the old food plot. I can come in under a certain wind direction and I have a big enough gap that I can get enough sunlight down to allow forage crops to grow. Cereal rye, you know, buckwheat, milo, those type things. So I'm always looking at a high deal food plot and if I see a high deal food plot location that I like because of access and elevation and other things, 
I'm going to fail and cut up and drag someone's trees out of the way or kill them standing with the herbicide because just like now, you see how much sun's coming in there. If I terminated those trees, there'd be that level of sun all summer long and I can get my backpack blower, blow the leaves out of the way, broadcast some green cover seed, and I'm off and running. So in addition to selecting trees, I'm looking for hunting locations also. Now, real soon, I'm gonna come back with you, just getting long-winded, and share with you and demonstrate the techniques I'm going to use to convert this stand from a absolute biological desert to very high quality wildlife habitat. I hope you'll join us for that. And more importantly, I hope you take time to get out. Boy, it's a beautiful sunny day. It's been cold and rainy. Enjoy creation like I am today. But even more importantly than enjoying creation is seeking the creator. Get to know him personally, develop a relationship with him and seek his will and apply it to your life. Thanks for watching Growing Deer.